Uh, my name is William Kuhn. I'm a professor of law uh, here at Hofstra University, which is where you are, as you know this. Uh, I'm also the academic dean here at Hofstra. And I'm very happy to welcome you to Hofstra University's 2017 Constitution Day event. Um, and I'm going to turn things over to Professor uh, James Sample. But I thought I just wanted to say a few brief words about today, why we're having this about Constitution Day. I couldn't uh, let this pass without sort of uh, just briefly touching on this. So as many of you know, this is September 18th, but September 17th, yesterday, 1787 is the day that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia signed the U.S. Constitution. And if you haven't taken constitutional law yet, um, you'll still have to see this government. This week they spent, the delegates spent the summer drafting it, they signed it on September 17th, and then they sent it to the people um, and the states. It was not ratified, though, uh, by the ninth state until June 1788, so it took quite a while to ratify. But September, September 17th is the day uh, they signed uh, the Constitution. Okay. What I was interested in, just like, you know, September 17th has not always been a holiday. Um, it was only designated uh, it's kind of a curious history. It used to be known as I Am a Citizen Day, believe it or not. Um, and uh, this is something that started in the 1940s. Um, and uh, it was originally in May, and then it was moved to September 17th in the 1950s and called Citizenship Day. And then, uh, due to the work of one woman who became very, believe the Constitution needs more. Um, sort of recognition in our public sort of space and especially in our education system. In 1997, a woman named Louis Lay founded a nonprofit called Constitution Day Inc. and she lobbied for years to make September 17th Constitution Day. And finally, in 2004, Congress agreed and changed Citizenship Day to Constitution Day. So that's why we today, the very our newest national holiday is Constitution Day. It's only officially declared by Congress in 2004. And Congress added a little thing which said that all schools in the United States that receive federal funding must have a Constitution Day event for their students of educational nature. And so, not surprisingly, we're having a Constitution Day event <laughs> of educational nature for our students. But as a scholar, as a teacher of constitutional law, I don't care. I'm always looking for an excuse to make students listen to us talk about constitutional law. So this is all good for me and for us here. Um, and so today I thought it would be, thought, uh, it would be great if we could focus our conversation on issue of, inter of public interest in the world, in our news, in our current events today. Um, and we have one of the nation's foremost experts on the question of whether a sitting president can be indicted or criminally prosecuted while he's in office. He's sitting right here, Professor Eric Friedman. So I thought, what better thing to do this year than uh, ha hear from him, since we have a nationally recognized scholar, um, and then also hear from our other nationally recognized scholar, Professor Leon Friedman, um, who uh, is not focused on this particular question, but has very strong and interesting views on this question as well. And I do hope we can have an interesting discussion as well. Uh, so with that, I want to turn things over to yet another nationally recognized scholar, James <laughs> Sample, uh, who will be our moderator today. He needs no introduction. So I'll just turn this over to Professor Sample. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Koo. I'm going to cut to the chase. You are attending an amazing law school, and you are attending a law school that in so many respects, to use the boxing analogy, punches not only beyond its weight class, but beyond any reasonable weight class. And today, it is because of the caliber of Hofstra Law that we have the collective privilege, whether we are faculty members or administrators or students, to learn from two genuine legal giants on a constitutional question that is both timely and timeless. Thomas Paine, in his famed work, Common Sense, wrote in 1776, that it was for all the world to know that, quote, so far as we approve of monarchy, in America, the law is king. For as in absolute governments, the king is law. So in free countries, the law ought to be king, and there ought to be no other. Before anyone compliments me for coming up with such a profoundly pertinent historical quotation, I want to be perfectly clear, I plagiarized it from a footnote written 25 years ago by Professor Eric Friedman. 
Today we will hear first from Professor Friedman, who is the C.D. B. Wilsey Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Rights. He is, as Dean Ku referenced, unequivocally one of the nation's leading constitutional scholars, both generally and specifically with respect to today's discussion. Second, we will hear commentary from Professor Leon Friedman. He is the Joseph Kushner Distinguished Professor of Civil, Civil Liberties Law, and he too is one of the nation's leading constitutional scholars. But I want to be clear that that praise is not hyperbolic event puffery. It is widely documented and acknowledged fact, whether in the fake media, the non-fake media, or in the bar, or in the, on the bench, or in the academy. Hoster law is privileged, all of us are privileged, to learn always, and especially today, from these two scholars and lawyers. We live in an era of hot takes and ersatz experts who serve as talking, and more often, screaming heads on cable news topics to which they have scarcely devoted an entire minute's worth of reflection. Professors Friedman and Friedman know a thing or two about hot takes, but theirs are the kind cultivated by deep research, by experience, by writing, and by thought. To wit, I want to take you on a brief mental journey to the fall of 1973. In the fall of 1973, Professor Leon Friedman was litigating three questions, according to his memory at that, of that fall. He was litigating the questions surrounding the constitutionality of the Vietnam War, given that Congress never declared war. He was litigating the constitutionality of the draft, and he was litigating whether a sitting president can be sued for damages for violating a person's constitutional rights. Seriously, that's dozens of legal careers, and it was Leon Friedman's October of 1973. <laughs> the reason I pick October of 1973 is that Professor Eric Friedman, on October 6th of that year, wrote a letter that was published in the New York Times. His letter to the editor argued that the president or vice president may be indicted while still in office. That, my friends, is what we call legit, and legit is how we roll at Hofstra Law. <laughs> As to your humble moderator, in the fall of 1973, I was being swaddled in my beloved red blanket <laughs> while awaiting my first birthday, and Professor Hofstra asked me to mention that she was not yet born. <laughs> So on a personal level, let me note that these two individuals are profound personal heroes of mine, and thus it gives me immense pleasure to turn the floor over first to Professor Eric Friedman. like that I bring home the wisdom of the excellent advice of Mark Twain who said um, that it's better to remain silent than you thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Um, and I must say that uh, that's particularly the case when one has the good fortune to be introduced by um, Professor Sample to who to my great pleasure if not to his. Um, has actually read my article and, poor guy, all the hundreds of footnotes. <laughs> but to proceed, um, the question at hand here today is not whether the president can be prosecuted for crimes that she commits while in office. That question is answered as clearly as any question in the constitutional law can possibly be by the Constitution itself, which reads, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. So the question here is simply whether 
the indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law has to wait until the president is out of office for whether it can happen while the president is still sitting. And in an unusual gift to people who interpret the Constitution toward, uh, according to original intent, we have direct evidence of original intent. In fact, a good deal of it, as Professor Sample, poor guy, will attest from reading my footnotes. Uh, but I can summarize it for you pretty quickly. What we find is the founding generation disagreed. And uh, I'll just give you one example. One of the senators who sat in the first Senate of the United States was a person named William McClay of Pennsylvania. And he, uh, to the benefit of historians, kept a diary. Um, and he has this entry for September 26, 1789. Um, from his time serving in the first Senate of the United States. When I first went into the Senate chamber this morning, the Vice President, Adams, Ellsworth and Ames stood together, railing against the vote of adherence in the House of Representatives on throwing out the word, the President, at the beginning of federal writs. That is, whether to commence a federal action, it should start the President of the United States commands you to do such and such on the model of the King commands such and such, or the United States commands you to do such and such, and the House of Representatives voted for the United States <coughs> and for the President. Okay. Um, I, I, McClay, really thought them wrong, but as they seemed very opinionated, I did not contradict them. This is only part of their old system of giving the President, as far as possible, every appendage of royalty. They said the president, personally, was not the subject of any process whatever, could have no action whatever brought against him, was above the power of all judges, justices, etc. For what, they said, would you put it in the power of a common justice to exercise any authority over him and stop the whole machine of government? I said that although president, he is not above the laws. Both of them declared you could only impeach him and no other process whatever lay against him. I put the case. Suppose the president committed murder in the street. Say I shot somebody on Fifth Avenue. Um, <laughs> impeach him? But you can only remove him from office on impeachment. Why, they replied. When he is no longer president, you can indict him. But, said I, in the meantime, he runs away. But I will put another case. Suppose he continues his murders daily and neither house is sitting to impeach him. Oh, they said, the people would rise and restrain him. Very well, I said. You will allow the mob to do what legal justice must abstain from. Mr. Adams said I was arguing from cases nearly impossible. There had been some hundreds of crowned heads within these two centuries in Europe, and there was no instance of any of them having committed murder. Very true in the retail way, Charles IX of France accepted. They generally do these things on a great scale. I am, however, entirely within the bounds of possibility, though it may be improbable. General Schuyler joined in. What think you, General? He replied, I think the president a kind of sacred person. Bravo, my Dro Divino, divine right of kings, man. Not a word of the above is worth minuting, but it shows clearly how amazingly fond of the old leaven many people are. So, our original intent isn't going to help us. They were having, right on the floor of the First Senate, exactly, precisely the debate that uh, we're having today. And so we're left to puzzle things out for ourselves based on, one, history, two, structure and policy considerations, and three, practicalities. And um, much as pains me, I will confine myself to only a few words under each of those headings. Um, and Professor Sample, uh, I'm sure, will leap in later to assure you that I have lots more support for everything I'm about to say. Um, okay.
history. Well, no president has ever been indicted while in office, but a vice president has, and in fact, for shooting someone. Anybody know who? Now that Hamilton is so popular, one would have, one would have hoped, one would have hoped that one of them would have come up. Um, uh, yeah, Vice President Aaron Burr was indicted by both the states of New York and New Jersey for killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel, which led Aaron Burr to write a letter to his daughter uh, saying, you have doubtless heard that there has uh, subsisted for some time a contention of a very singular nature between the states of New York and New Jersey. The subject in dispute is which shall have the honor of hanging the vice president. I have not now the leisure to state the various pretensions of the parties, nor is it yet known that the vice president has made his election, though a paper received this morning asserts, but without authority, that he had determined in favor of the New York tribunals. Actually, although Ackenberg had in fact decided he would uh, surrender in face of the charges in New York, he, on second thought, thought it was more prudent to uh, travel out west where he allegedly engaged in the Burr conspiracy, uh, which we'll talk to you about on some other occasion. Um, but for our purposes, the, the point is that 11 United States Sanders wrote a letter to the governor of New Jersey requesting him in polite terms to try to get the prosecution dropped. Uh, and the basis for that request was not that Aaron Burr had immunity, but rather that the governor should um, please be so kind as to, quote, facilitate the public business by relieving the president of the Senate from the peculiar embarrassments of his present situation, and the Senate from the distressing imputation thrown on it by holding up its president to the world as a common murderer. Oh, now, an argument from silence can be pushed on so far, but I do think it's worth pointing out that many of the founders were alive and active at this point, including President Thomas Jefferson and Secretary of State James Madison, both of whom were supporting their Vice President Aaron Burr at this moment. Um, but nobody made the argument that he had immunity from criminal charges while in office. Okay, two. Uh, that leads me to my second point, which has to do with constitutional structure and policy. Everyone agrees that the reason the Constitution is written the way it is, that clause that says, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law, is to abolish the English system in which impeachment for misconduct in office resulted in a criminal trial on the floor of Parliament, which could result in imprisonment, fines, confiscation of your estate, and in theory, capital punishment. Um, and the framers wanted to separate out the question of abuse of office from the issue of criminality. And so, as Hamilton wrote in The Federalism, the purpose of impeachment is to reach those offenses, quote, of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be denominated political. That is, those which proceed from the abuse or violation of some public trust, rendering the office holder unworthy of public confidence. For example, Congress could properly have considered Richard Nixon's secret bombing of Cambodia an impeachable offense, even if not a crime, and removed him from office on the basis that a leader who committed 
sustained acts of war against a neutral country and lied to uh, the public about it, had abused his power by preventing Congress and the public from having input into the policy. In contrast, the criminal law has nothing to do with abuse of office. It embodies a minimum standard of behavior that society requires of all citizens. And so if, for instance, Lyndon Johnson drove drunk and got into a major car wreck that caused a lot of damages, he should have been convicted of drunk and driving, <coughs> not impeached, um, so that society could express its disapproval of the conduct while retaining a political leader who's done nothing to uh, undermine its political legitimacy. And so the basis of my position is that we want both tools, impeachment and criminal prosecution, to be available in appropriate circumstances. The policy argument is simply that it makes no sense to have to impeach Lyndon Johnson and thereby lose a perfectly good president because otherwise the public is unable to express how strong it feels about it. Now, of course, a president might do some things, like obstruct justice, that are both an abuse of office and a crime. Um, and in that case, it might not matter much whether impeachment or indictment comes first. And in fact, it may make practical good sense, for all the reasons you'll hear, to get the president out of office first. Um, but my point, taking the long view, is that there's no point in inventing a constitutional immunity that might remove that flexibility in the future. And so, third, that leads to some practical objections to my position. And since those practical objections really are the heart of the argument on the other side, I'll try to be fair in considering them. But I'm also trying to be fairly terse um, much terser than in my article where I devoted many pages to responding to all of this. And so if I miss any, um, and if the people up there fail to, fail to do a complete job of pointing out all the practical problems um, with the suggestion of prosecuting the president while still in office, by all means, you people should. Um, uh, the heart of the practical objection is that in all substance, indicting the president, making her defend the proceedings, and imposing a sentence is to remove the president from office. Um, and that can be only done by impeachment uh, after a majority vote in the House, two thirds vote in the Senate, not by some prosecutor. Um, and in fact, you will sometimes in, in few more recent op-eds, some prosecutor overturning the results of the national election. Um, there are a series of responses to this which add up to saying that it's simply not true that subjecting the president to criminal prosecution is a practical matter of removal of office. First of all, all the legal proceedings would be conducted by lawyers. Second of all, you are probably talking about relatively minor charges like drunk driving, meaning less need for personal presidential involvement, because if it's such a major crime that it's also an impeachable offense, then, as we already said, both of them are likely to be in play. Um, and making the president defend in a criminal case is no more a removal from office than making the president defend impeachment. And in fact, the two presidents of the United States whose uh, impeachment trials have ever gotten as far as the Senate, um, Andrew uh, Johnson and William Clinton, didn't show up in the Senate, they sent their lawyers to um, and we're both quick. Um, and even if the president is heavily involved in defending the criminal case,
case, there is always the option for stepping aside temporarily under Section 3 of the 26th Amendment and then reclaiming the office. And the way that works, the president just sends a letter saying, I'm temporarily unable to um, perform the duties of the office. And then after a while, sends back a letter saying, now I'm able to perform the duties of the office. And that is commonly done, for example, when the president is about to enter surgery. Um, uh, great, Professor. Um, but surely making the president serve a criminal sentence is a rule of office. Well, first of all, that depends on the sentence. Um, and especially in less serious cases, there are a variety of creative options that sentencing judges exercise all the time, um, like house arrest. Um, there are, um, is a good deal of experience, in fact, with serving governors, mayors, and others uh, doing criminal time and judges having to think of creative ways to um, make sure that people don't lose their governor or um, mayor, whatever it may be. And with respect to presidents in particular, uh, we have a lot of experience with them being made to testify, which after all is like to talk a lot more than criminal prosecutions, and in which all the same objections apply. Who's got time, who's got distraction, a thousand people will be swarming around wanting to the president's testimony. Um, but judges have, in fact, uh, exercised a lot of creativity in that context and come to solutions which get the um, data to the party needing it um, while still letting the president function. And in fact, the very first um, precedent in that regard comes from the trial of Aaron Burr after he got back and was on trial for the Burr conspiracy. He promptly sent a letter he promptly sent a subpoena for exculpatory evidence to President Jefferson, which uh, the trial judge, John Marshall, sitting as a trial judge, um, enforced with conditions to minimize the inconvenience of the president. Um, but again, even if the sentence includes jail time, um, whether for a month or two or for a series of weekends, or the president can use Section 3 of the 25th Amendment to serve. After all, that amendment specifically contemplates that the president might be unavailable for one reason or another. And the framers of that amendment, who uh, were law professors and uh, senators who wrote lots of law review articles about their drafting process and policy choices they made, um, deliberately left it broad to include things like the president is captured by enemies and held hostage and therefore unable to discharge duties. Uh, you know, serving a criminal sentence reasonably falls in that and when the president's able and released by the captives or released by the jailer, um, the president comes back. The idea that the president steps aside for a while um, expresses contrition by serving the sentence and returns to the good graces of the country the way celebrities do quite frequently. They sort of take a break from the public life to work on their drug issues or their anger issues or their drinking issues or their sexual addiction issues or whatever it may be. They can go off to rehab for a while and come back and resume their public careers. Um, well, that's not absurd and might make sense in some circumstances. So my conclusion is um, that far from being practical, my position is the one that makes sense. Instead of inventing a rigid immunity rule, we should reject it and thereby retain for the future a potentially valuable restraint on abuses of power.
Uh, I'm in a funny position because uh, many years ago, in October of 1973, in fact, uh, I'm representing a client who sued, the, who sued Nixon. There's a man named Mort Halpern. And Mort Halpern worked for the government for five months and then left, and for 16 months he was wiretapped by order of President Nixon uh, because they wanted to get some political uh, activity from him. And we sued Nixon for damages uh, for obtaining a wiretap without uh, uh, getting a warrant of any kind, allegedly for national security purposes. Which, you know, the whole theory was that he was a leaker. The worst thing you can do in the world is be a leaker, according to Nixon and our current president. <laughs> Uh, but uh, eventually, uh, another person, Mr. Fitzgerald, uh, uh, was fired by the United States because he did some, you know, he engaged in a certain amount of whistleblowing. Uh, he testified before Congress about some overrides on one of their bills, and uh, Nixon didn't like it and ordered him to be fired. And he was fired, and he brought an action against uh, uh, against Nixon. Now, whistleblowing is a very serious uh, matter if you expose fraud or other things happening in government. And he had a very plausible uh, case against Nixon because that was the reason he was fired. Well, the case went to the Supreme Court. And guess what the Supreme Court said? That a sitting president cannot be sued for damages because of any official action that he took while president. Nixon versus Fitzgerald, 457 U.S. 731. And that case, you know, that was a case uh, decided in 1982. It took a while for this to get up to the Supreme Court. Nixon had been out of office in 74. Um, but the reason was, and I have to do the three, go over the three matters that uh, Professor Eric Friedman said, history, uh, what the Constitution says, and practical problems. And in the Nixon versus the Gerald case, they quoted from Joseph Story. Now, Joseph Story was the second smartest justice ever to serve on the Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holden being the greatest of all. And he was also around for a lot of the activities. You know, this was a, a, he served in the early 1800s. He was certainly aware of what was happening. And he wrote commentaries on the Constitution. And uh, there's, uh, in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, commentaries on the Constitution, 1833. So he was around when all this was happening. And he said, there are incidental powers belonging to the executive department which are necessarily implied from the nature of the functions which are confided to it, among most necessarily be included to perform them. The president cannot be liable for arrest, imprisonment, or detention while he is in the discharge of his duties of his office and for this purpose, his person must be deemed, in civil cases at least, to possess an official inviolability. So here is Joseph's story right after the formation of the, of the Constitution, writing, and I, I will tell you that his commentaries are very often cited by, uh, uh, by the Supreme Court. And in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, they said, that if you allow the president to be sued for civil damages, uh, should affect the way in which the country is, uh, is ruled. Cognizance of this personal vulnerability could distract the president from his public duties to the detriment of not only the president and his office, but the nation that the presidency was designed to serve. Now, if he can't be sued for personal damages while he is president, can, be can he be indicted while he is president 
for activities he took while president. I mean, there is this whole issue of the president going out and right, robbing banks late at night or raping people in you know, disguise. And that, that does present some problems. But uh, uh, using his official duties, firing Comey was that obstruction of justice. And does that uh, distract the president from his public duties uh, to the detriment not only of the president and his office, but the nation that the presidency was designed uh, to serve? Now, if I look at the Constitution here, and carry it with me at all times, and if you read the, uh, the section that Eric has, has been talking about, judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal of office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States, but the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment. Seems to me that if they thought the president, uh, you know, why didn't they say judgment in cases of impeachment? Uh, well, they, they don't got removal of office. But if he was subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment, why wasn't that put into the Constitution as a basis for removing the president? Seems to me, if you thought that the president had done something so offensive that it violated local law, he should be removed from office. He could be removed from office through the actual indictment itself, through the indictment and conviction itself. So it seems to me as you read that section and they talk about you know, impeachment and then indictment, uh, why didn't they say something if they thought that the president could be removed? Why is impeachment the only way to do that? You know, it seems to me that if they believe that he should also be removed for violating the criminal law, you know, isn't that a... Uh, you know, shouldn't that have been included in that very section? Now, as far as the 25th Amendment is concerned, passed in 1967, and presumably this is a post-Nixon uh, uh, you know, amendment, uh, because, again, Nixon did not such good things uh, along the way, obstruction of justice, uh, you know, ordering the FBI, ordering the CIA to stop the FBI from investigating the Watergate uh, break-in. Uh, you know, all of these things certainly would, would have constituted obstruction of justice if President Ford had not, uh, uh, had, had not uh, pardoned him uh, at the time. But even with, uh, even with, the, with all of those terrible things that he had done, uh, there really was no basis for indicting him while he was the president. I mean, a little later on in the other major case dealing with the president's power, Clinton versus Jones. Now, what happened there? Remember, Nick, Nixon was sued for activities he engaged in while president, but he was sued after he, was, after he had no longer served so that the offending activity happened while he was president, but he was being sued after he was president, so that the suit would no longer affect the presidential duties. I mean, Nixon was sued in the 1970s, 1980s, long after he had left office. So uh, the suit could no longer affect his ability to be president. But, if a president knew he could be sued for things he did while president, he would, you know, uh, be hesitant about taking these actions. It would affect every president's ability to perform as president. And that's the reason why they, they found that, again, Nixon, Fitzgerald versus Nixon, 
after he's president, he sued for activities while he was president. What's wrong with that? It would affect the ability of a president to take certain actions. Will I be sued for this while I'm president? While I'm president? Now, if a president could be indicted while he's president, would that affect his view of his own office? Would he hesitate to take certain actions? Ooh, I will be indicted for this. And it seems to me, if we are concerned about the president's performance of his duties, he would be more hesitant to take some action as president if he thought that this was an immediately indictable offense. Now, in the Clinton case, they, now Clinton was sued for activities he took as governor. He wasn't sued for activities he took while president. He was uh, sued for activities he took as governor, but he was sued while he was president. So the whole thing shifts one over. You know, suing for, for things you did while president, after you're, a pre after you're no longer the president, or suing, being sued while you're president for something you did uh, uh, before you were president. And what did the Supreme Court say in that? Uh, they, they said, there is not, uh, other than a trial may consume some of the president's time and attention, there is nothing in the record to enable a judge to assess the personal harm that may ensue from scheduling a trial. In other words, so what do you have to go through uh, while you're a defendant in a civil case? Well, discovery, you have to take your deposition, which happened with Clinton. But, uh, uh, and then there may be a trial. But the trial could happen later if and when the court's discretion were permitted to manage, manage those actions in such fashion, including the deferral of trial, that interference with the president's duties would not occur. In other words, we don't want the judicial department interfering with the president's duty as president. He's president 24 hours a day. And we want him to pay attention to all of those uh, all of those concerns. Now, if he's indicted while president, is he going to spend more time fighting the indictment than he is, uh, uh, you know, than he's acting as president? Now, the 25th Amendment comes in here, and it's true, the president, my favorite uh, application of the 25th Amendment was in West Wing. <coughs> Remember when his daughter, who won an Emmy last night, remember her? Uh, his daughter was kidnapped by a foreign terrorist. Now, while they were investigating, would a president spend a lot, a lot of time uh, uh, trying to get the, the kidnappers and getting his daughter out of, uh, out of uh, their clutches, rather than be president? Well, he did, and indeed, he you know, did what the 25th Amendment required. And uh, you know, then, of course, the authority got back, and the Speaker of the House was a terrible person, so he was very happy to get, uh, to get rid of him. But once the President says, I am back in, I can now do my office, Congress, by two-thirds vote of both houses, can say, no, you're not. We don't want you to continue. Now, under those circumstances, why isn't impeachment the best way to do it? We're asking, uh, instead of a simple majority in the House to uh, impeach him, you need a two-thirds. Uh, the president tries to get back in uh, uh, after he's, he's been removed for whatever reason. And he tries to get back and say, hey, I'm not capable of doing it again. You need two thirds of both houses in order to overrule that. Well, that's even a higher standard than impeachment. So why isn't impeachment really the way in which to take care of all of this? Now, what is a high crime and misdemeanor? Treason, bribery, or a high crime or misdemeanor? High crime is everything above the 20th floor, if you do everything <laughs> above the 20th floor, it's a high crime. 
And all the historians say a high crime is misuse of your office. And misuse of, his, of the office may very well not be a crime. But is a high crime rape or murder? You know, and there is a whole problem about that. Uh, we have the hypothetical of the president committing murder, committing. Uh, is that a high crime or misdemeanor? Well, as Gerald Ford said, a high crime or misdemeanor is anything that Congress thinks is a high crime or misdemeanor. So, I, I mean, I'm very a, a very reluctant questioner of the president's uh, uh, immunity for, for prosecution while he's president, and I simply think that the proper way to do it is to impeach him. Thank you very much. I really, I, I really do appreciate the questions because it lets me talk about footnote 81 in my article. Um, it's, it's true that in um, the uh, in uh, Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court said everything that Professor Dugan said. In the course of explaining why they were construing the statute not to give a cause of action. They, what they wrote was they didn't think that the general damages statute against um, public officers for violations of the Constitution was intended <coughs> to cover the president because of all these great reasons. Right? Um, and then um, uh, the one that um, uh, Professor Freeman particularly quotes is, well, um, one of those reasons is that the president will be chilled from the vigorous exercise of office by knowing that there's a potential for being sued and therefore won't make the right decision. Um, well now, <laughs> the place where that argument was made most powerfully was by President Richard Nixon in the United States versus Nixon, in which a subpoena was sought to be enforced for conversations uh, in pursuance of the Watergate conspiracy between President Nixon and the Attorney General and other high cabinet uh, officers. And um, President Nixon's uh, position in defense was, um, that um, you can't enforce a subpoena like that because that will chill my ability to um, have conversations with my close advisors, you know, because they may be subpoenaed someday by some prosecutor. And um, the um, court um, rejected that. Um, and um, said, quote, we cannot conclude that advisors will be moved to temper the candor of their remarks by the infrequent occasion of disclosure because of the possibility that such conversations will be called for in the context of a criminal prosecution, citing a much earlier case um, by Justice Cardozo having to do with the limited circumstances in which you could find out things that happened during jury deliberations, and the same argument is made, well, you know, jurors won't be candid if they know that their comments will be made public. And Justice Cardozo said, the chance that now and then there may be found some timid soul who will take counsel of his fears and give way to the, their repressive power is too remote and shadowy to shape the course of justice. So this you know, concept that um, <coughs> no, we can't, uh, prosecute the president because um, he'll be uh, chilled from doing the right thing isn't really an argument for why, why he's immune from prosecution while in office, because after all, the same thing applies if the criminal prosecution is brought after the president leaves office, just the same way that 
the civil case was brought after Nixon left office if the president was going to be chilled, and presumably the president would be as chilled um, by a prosecution that's going to happen before the next person is inaugurated or the one that's going to happen after the next person is inaugurated. The answer to all that is, in fact, to draw the analogy from civil cases about immunity, which distinguish between things that are reasonably within the scope of what we expect the officer to do and things that are just beyond the pale. And in fact, um, what the Nixon versus Fitzgerald case said is um, there's an absolute immunity for civil causes of action based upon conduct within the outer perimeters of the president's duty. So, um, the famous <coughs> civil case that has to do with this a case called Reynolds, in which a um, spy said he had a contract with the federal government during the Civil War to be a spy, and the federal government had to pay, and case dismissed on the grounds of state secrets, because after at least there was such a thing was well within the scope of the uh, powers. Well, so by analogy, if um, the uh, accusation in um, the criminal case is um, that uh, the um, uh, there's a, a criminal fraud action against the president the spy wasn't paid. Well, that's you know, well within the outer perimeters of the duties and is dismissed, not because the president has immunity from criminal prosecution, but because as a substantive matter, we're not permitting such things. If, on the other hand, the criminal accusation is that the spy and the president were sitting in the Oval Office and got into a big dispute about who's going to win uh, the National Football League next year, and the president, in outrage, killed the spy, well, that's nowhere within the outer perimeters of the president's duty. And so, as a substantive matter, we would say that prosecution can go ahead. Right? And again, that's by analogy how we work in the uh, civil sphere, and that's how the criminal one should work. The criminal one should work that there is no um, blanket immunity, but as a substantive, as a substantive matter, will shape the contours of criminal liability accordingly. And um, uh, Professor Friedman wanted to know, well, why doesn't the Constitution say, well, that's fine, you can be removed from office if you commit crimes. Um, the whole tradition <coughs> here is you're going to be prosecuted while you're in office for crimes, but not removed, right? You, pay your debt to society and stay in office. And there, again, may well be circumstances under which all of that makes perfectly good sense. And it is true that the um, 25th Amendment works in such a way by design that it is more difficult to involuntarily remove and replace the president than to impeach him. That was designed exactly to avoid a palace coup. And so what we're talking about is circumstances where um, the public will be satisfied by the president apologizing to the public for this age of serving the sanctions imposed by the courts and retaining office. If the um, outraged public wants the president out, it's just going to happen anyway. Again, bottom line, the idea here is that there may be things which are criminal, abhorrent, and should be punished, um, but actually don't affect your ability to perform your public policy role uh, perfectly well. Um, some of you may know that um, uh, Grover Cleveland, uh, when Grover Cleveland ran for office, it was um, raised as a campaign issue against him. 
uh, entirely accurately, that he had fathered an illegitimate child. Um, so the um, the New York Times wrote an editorial that said, well, it appears that the um, objections to Robert Leland are that he's fathered an illegitimate child. No one has uh, made any appropriate complaint uh, against the public policy decision. On the other hand, with respect to Warren Harding, whose management of the country has become a disaster, no one has ever suggested that there's any impropriety in his life. And so we would suggest to the voters that um, they return Mr. Harding to the station for which he's so eminently qualified to be a husband and father back uh, home and bring Mr. Cleveland to the White House to run the country. And that's what the voters did. Okay. So, like those in the audience, I have several questions, uh, but I will uh, defer to the audience after asking just one. My real question is, why is Lyndon Johnson driving his own car? Um, but that aside, that aside, uh, I'm curious, and you referenced this in your article, Professor Friedman, how, uh, and obviously this has come up uh, at least in news reports, not necessarily in the actuality thereof, uh, but in recent months, how, if at all, you think uh, the pardon power bears on this question, as uh, Judge Robert Bork, uh, certainly uh, an esteemed thinker on matters of this nature, has uh, weighed in on his view of how the pardon power bears. I want to hear your response. Um, yes, it, it is the fact that my law professor, Robert Bork, who I think uh, was a fabulous, fabulous law professor, fair, honest, and unbiased in treating every side of every question, although I'm very happy that he never served on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, it is true that um, he said, oh, well, this is all nonsense because the president could pardon himself. Okay. As a logical matter, that has nothing to do with whether the president can prosecute while in office. If the president today grants himself a pardon for every act which he may have committed against the United States up until today, there's a whole separate issue whether the pardon power extends so far. But assuming the pardon power does extend so far, then it works whether a prosecution is tried to be brought by still in office or tried to be brought afterwards. And again, nobody doubts the president would be prosecuted afterwards. So the, there's no logical connection between the pardon power issue and the question of does the prosecution have to wait until later. But there's a somewhat broader answer also, which is that, again, we are, this, I am contemplating a scenario in which the um, criminal prosecution basically cleans off the debt to society. Um, whereas, of course, anything like that would not only raise an absolute firestorm and very likely get the person impeached, but most critically, the pardon power only works for offenses against the United States and not for state prosecutions. And once the person's out of office, there are at least 30 state attorney generals with more than enough incentive to go try to find some um, criminal activity uh, for state offenses. For that reason, Richard Nixon had research done into whether he could pardon himself, and the advice came back, yes, you can. You have the power to pardon yourself. And having gotten that advice, he decided not to exercise that power because it would create so many practical problems. But one sentence answer is, um, if it works, then it works whether you're being prosecuted during your time in office or after. Uh, it's not so much the pardon power. I remove from office every prosecutor who tries to prosecute me. I mean, Mueller is sub unfortunately is subject to the Justice Department. And until, unless and until there's a true independent counsel, the president can simply, as chief of the executive office, simply fire every single person that makes any effort at all 
uh, you know, to bring criminal charges against them. I mean, that's the real practical issue. I mean, uh, for those of you who remember this, when Nixon fired Archibald Cox, who was under his control, under the Justice Department control, it was, it was Congress who immediately passed a true independent uh, Watergate Prosecution Act. And that's when Leon Jaworski was appointed. And Leon Jaworski could not be fired by the president. But we don't have that system anymore. Congress allowed the, that, that independent counsel to uh, law to expire. So as of now, the president could fire any federal prosecutor who attempted to bring charges against them. And there's, you know, who's the, who's the person who's, who's going to indict him? So we really need Congress to come in, which they haven't done yet. There, I agree a thousand percent. And in fact, uh, Dean Irwin, Chairman Rinsky, and I wrote an, an op ed piece in the Los Angeles Times in May saying exactly this, which is the following Mueller, who has been point, uh, appointed under Justice Department regulations, is bound by Justice Department policy, and the Justice Department policy is the president can't be indicted, not surprisingly. And therefore, if uh, he were to indict the president, he could properly be fired by the president for it because it's a violation of Justice Department policy. And what we need is exactly what uh, Professor Friedman said. In the wake of Watergate, um, starting in 1978 and running through 1999, there was a true independent counsel uh, who could only uh, be fired under very restricted circumstances. And, um, may know, and the rest of you will learn, that the constitutionality of that statute was upheld strongly by the Supreme Court in a case called Morrison versus Olson. But what then happened was that in a bipartisan collusion, the um, Congress let it expire in 1999 because nobody liked having a real independent counsel. The uh, Republicans were very unhappy about the Iran-Contra investigation. The Democrats were very unhappy about the um, Whitewater investigation which went into Monica Lewinsky, and all of them were thought that having a really independent prosecutor was a bad thing, and so when the statute expired, they didn't renew it. Um, that was not only bad public policy in terms of investigations, but contrary to their own self interest, because only a really independent prosecutor has credibility when they announced that there has been no wrongdoing and there was an independent counsel investigation into former Attorney General Edwin Meese into Theodore Olson, the one that went to um, in Morrison versus Olson. And in both cases, the conclusion was no wrongdoing, no cause for any of it. And that um, is a lot more credible coming from somebody who's independent, and members of Congress who support the incumbent president being under investigation should cherish that part of it. They believe what they're saying. Of course, the opposition always does that. And the other somewhat related thing is that, as some of you may know from the Comey firestorm, it is not appropriate for a normal prosecutor who decides not to prosecute somebody to issue a long, detailed report about why we're not prosecuting somebody. That's, that really is contrary to Justice Department. Um, but it is not only appropriate, but statutorily mandated for an independent counsel to issue a report that says, I have fully investigated whatever charge is against this high government official and concluded that there is no basis for prosecution on the following basis, which is, you know, um, in, entirely what you would want when a serious charge of wrongdoing is brought against a high government official. So uh, I'm completely in agreement with uh, Professor Friedman that it's unfortunate that in the current situation we don't have the legal mechanism by which an independent prosecutor could look at the competing lines of argument and decide, first of all, 
whether who's got the better constitutional argument. Uh, and in both um, the Watergate Special Prosecution Task Force and the um, Clinton, the Cass Starr's investigation, staff memos were written to the prosecutor saying, yes, the Constitution would permit you to indict the president if you're so disposed. Um, and um, both of those prosecutors said, well, that may be true, but there are prosecutorial discretion reasons not to do it. And that's fine. That's what you want. That's what you want an independent prosecutor to do today. His or her own judgment about the constitutional question and then about the prosecutorial discretion question. And for that reason, uh, although it hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet and hasn't gone very far yet, a few Republican senators, Lindsey Graham, Senator Flake, um, are now beginning to talk, and in some cases talk with um, some Democratic senators, like Senator Blumenthal, uh, about reviving some form of special prosecutor, independent counsel um, legislation, because they understand these problems. Of course, the reason the talks haven't gotten very far is because they keep pumping up against the problem that, um, yeah, they want, they, they, they want to get the credibility of an independent uh, view of whatever is going on in this administration, but don't want real investigations of real wrongdoing. And until um, the um, public demands the revival of a mechanism that actually worked well from 1978 to 1999, um, we're in a... <coughs> In a, blip, in a blip period, anyway, in which um, the <coughs> constitutional question is unlikely to be tested. Questions? Um, so, since you said that the, the, the Department of Justice's policy is that you cannot indict the sitting president, and now that Mueller is under the Department of Justice, who would, if we were to indict the sitting president now for obstruction of justice, who would bring that? Well, um, <coughs> no, fe as, as uh, let's be correct, no federal prosecutor could do that. As far as I'm concerned, in fact, a <coughs> state prosecutor can do it. Um, and that, and all the you know, hackles go up, how can you pass such a thing? Well, the answer is um, the Congress can always protect against that result by passing a statute saying that no state prosecution can be brought while the president is still sitting, which it hasn't. But the, um, the um, Congress has provided, and this goes back way back to 1833 when the states were obstructing federal authority, um, that if a um, federal officer is indicted for the performance of his federal duties, he has removal to the federal courts. So that's thought to be a protection. And also, some of you may be aware that um, the general rule is that you can't enjoin a state prosecution which you think is unconstitutional, except in extraordinary circumstances, is would probably be extraordinary circumstances. So the short answer to your question is, um, if it is to be tested under the current legal environment, it actually has to be tested by a state prosecutor, and um, that would tee up the constitutional in a slightly oblique way, right, because you could go off either on the federalism point that states can't do it, or the broader point that, no, he's immune while in office. I know the issue is whether or not there's certain immunity for someone in that position of their bad acts and what those bad acts are. But as you were saying before, Professor Leon Friedman, um, whether those acts happen prior to presidency or whether they happen during the presidency and those claims are brought after, is there any question or concern as regards to statute of limitations at all or is that not any, it's not in question at all? 
Well, I mean, the general rule is that there is a bar to a prosecution for some legal reason, and that tolls the statute of limitations. You know, in other words, if you couldn't do it uh, for the period of time that the president was, was there, he, he was immune, uh, it seems to me that the statute of limitations would probably be tolled uh, you know, uh, after his, his immunity was gone. In, 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 in 1973, in my letter to the editor of the New York Times, I suggested that the general statute of limitations for federal crimes was five years. And so if you're in office for eight years and you can't be prosecuted, and you could get away with it by just staying in office for eight years. In response to which, um, some people on the other side said, oh well, as part of the immunity that we are inventing, we're also announcing that, that a court would apply a rule of tolling the statute of limitations for the period during which you're immune from prosecution. And that may well be so, but it's also <coughs> The other pardon power, by the way, is not only the pardon of the president, who pardoned every witness who could possibly uh, you know, testify against you. Uh, you know, there's a whole issue about that. If you pardon him, then they're still subject. To, they can't raise the Fifth Amendment when they testify. And if they lie while they're, while they're testifying, then you can always get into that crime. The way you do this, the way you do this, um, but this, of course, is not really stupid. But, but um, the way you do this is you assure your, you, you tell you all your co-conspirators to hang tough and say nothing. Um, even if they have to serve a few years in jail in the meantime. But then you pardon them on your way out of office, right? Uh, thereby, thereby solving all, all, all of those problems. Um, but yes, getting, getting a little far too far. Others? Yes, I'll ask one more question and we can stop maybe at 1 30. But uh, I have a question about the dichotomy that you pose as between official and non official acts. So there clearly is a spectrum, and, and certainly Cambodia is on one end of the spectrum, and drunk driving is on the other end of the spectrum. But I'm a little dubious. I suspect Dean Ku may share some of these views, or, or may not, but I, I have a suspicion that he at least has some of the same. Uh, hesitation I do with respect to this full, full throttle uh, praise of the independent council provisions, isn't there a, a real potential for bootstrapping that in essence collapses this dichotomy between official and unofficial such that, for example, a sitting president um, lies under oath in a deposition that arises, as Professor Leon Friedman pointed out, from conduct uh, prior to becoming the president. Uh, but because that uh, potentially perjurious, perjurious uh, lie under oath is occurring while he or she is the president, uh, that becomes its own independent basis for a prosecution. Well, that's exactly what happened to Clinton. Yeah, no, that, that's the that's the he, he was <laughs> Because he said, it depends on what your definition of is, is. is. I don't know what the definition is. Or is. <laughs> 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 leaving, leaving all that aside, the, yes, and, 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 and as I said, there are, there are certain situations like obstruction of justice in which you might have something that both an impeachable offense and a, um, and a crime, um, and obstruction of justice may well be one, and um, this also arose during the Nixon impeachment as follows. One of the charges against Nixon was that he had backdated the deed of gift on some papers that he donated to the federal government, he donated the uh, vice presidential um, papers to the federal government, got a big tax deduction for that. Subsequently, the law was changed so that he wouldn't get a tax deduction for that. And um, he backdated the deed of gift to make it look as though he had um, done it while his tax law was still good for him, thereby defrauding the government. Okay, the Watergate prosecution 